Hello and welcome to the reading of chapter 5 of the book Owls in the Family by Farley Moat. Before we start reading chapter 5 of Owls in the Family, I have a few uh, vocabulary words that will help you understand this book a little better. And if you haven't read chapters 1 through 4 with us, I hope you'll go back and do that. Here we have a map that shows Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is the setting of this book. On this map, you can see the red part here is all the country of Canada, and Saskatoon is a city in the province of Saskatchewan, and this is Saskatchewan, and there is Saskatoon right there. And so hopefully that will help you get a picture in your head of the setting of this book. It's in Canada. And then the next words, there's a few words here we've already discussed from other chapters in the book. We'll review real quick. Yellow measles, prairie, gopher. They talk a lot about gophers, especially in the first few chapters of this book. Bluff, they use differently in this book than any way I've ever heard it. They say that in this book they're calling a group of cottonwood trees in the middle of a prairie a bluff. Haversack. Indian file, which means a single file line, one behind the other. Annoyed or peeved, uh, just means when you're a little irritated. Scrounging, looking for something. And then now we're on the vocabulary for chapter five. And in chapter five, you'll hear the term pedal like 40. Pedal like 40, they just mean to pedal a bike as fast as you can, to try to pedal the bike up to 40 miles in one hour. And you'll hear the words can the can, which is the name of a game that they play. They use a tin can to play a game or a sport that people like to play. The game is like a combination of baseball and football, but played with a can. So let's read the book Owls in the Family by Farley Moat. And we'll start with chapter 5 in this reading. Though there were only a few more weeks left of school before the summer holidays began, each day seemed a hundred years long. I could hear the river boiling over and the sandbars as I sat at my desk, and I could smell the sticky sweet smell of the young poplar leaves. Our school stood right beside the river and every now and then a flock of ducks would go over the playground, quack, quack, quacking, as if they were laughing at us for being stuck inside. While they were flying free across the wide prairie. What made it even worse for me was just sitting there wondering what my owls were doing. After school, I would jump on my bike and pedal like 40 over the bridge and down our street. When I got close to home, I would give a couple of owl whoops to let wool and weeps know I was coming. By the time I skidded into the yard and parked my bike, they would be tramping impatiently up and down the cage, and as soon as the door would open, they would come waddling out as fast as they could, ready for play. Wool liked to scramble on back of an old lawn chair, and then he would take a wild leap and try to land on my shoulder. If he missed, he would nosedive into the lawn, but it never bothered him much. He would hop back onto the chair, climb up, and try again until finally he made my shoulder. Weeps was different. He never believed he could do anything by himself. So he would just sit on the lawn and whimper until I picked him up and put him on my other shoulder. I think Weep's spirit must have been broken in the oil drum, because as long as I knew him, he was always afraid of doing things. With both owls riding on my shoulders, I used to go down the street to where our gang played games in an empty lot. Can the Can was a favorite game that spring, sort of a combination of baseball and football. We used an inflated rubber beach ball that belonged to Murray, and when all the kids got chasing it, Wool would get so excited he would join in too. One time he got in the way of the ball just when someone kicked it and it knocked the wind clean out of him. The next time the ball came near him he made a hissing sound 
He made a jump and got a hold of it with both sets of claws. There was a hissing noise, and the ball went limp. Wool was pleased as punch, but we weren't, because it was the only ball we had. All the kids except Bruce and Murray were a bit scared of the owls, so when I had them on my shoulders, I could go anywhere in Saskatoon and be safe as houses. Even the tough kids down by the flour mill kept their distance when I had the owls with me. Those owls were better bodyguards than tigers. Wool and Weeps grew flat fast. Weeps would eat anything he could get and still be hungry, but Wool was fussy about his food. At first, Wool would only eat cooked butcher's meat, hard-boiled eggs, and a fig cookies. Later on, he would eat anything that came from our table, even vegetables, all except parsnips, which he hated. Occasionally, both owls would eat a dead gopher that some kid had shot or snared as a present for them, but they didn't really like their supper raw. By the middle of June, when they were three months old, my new pets had reached full size. Wool was a, bigger, a little bigger than Weeps and stood about two feet high, but his wing spread was nearly five feet across. The claws of both were about an inch long and looked as sharp as needles, and their big hooked beaks looked strong enough to open a tin can. Weeps was a normal owl color, sort of molted brown, but wool stayed almost pure white, with just a few black markings on his feathers. At night, he looked like a ghost. Although they were grown up now, neither of the owls seemed to know what his wings were for. Because they saw us walking around, they seemed to think they had to walk around too. Maybe if I had been able to fly, they would have learned to fly a lot sooner. But the way things were, both owls tried to do what we kids did. They saw us climbing trees, and so they took to climbing trees. It was pretty silly to watch Wool climbing. He used to really climb. First he'd jump up to a low branch, and then he'd use his beaks and claws to half lift himself half shinny to the next branch. My pigeons used to circle around sometimes and watch him. They must have thought he was crazy. People sometimes thought so too. One day, Wool was climbing a poplar in our front yard when a man and a woman stopped on the sidewalk and watched him with their mouths open. Finally, the man said to me, What on earth's the matter with that bird? Why doesn't he fly to the top of the tree? He can't fly, sir, I replied. He never learned how. The man looked at me as if I were crazy, too, and walked off without another word. That day, Wool, the day Wool learned to fly was one I'll remember for a long time. He had climbed a cottonwood in the backyard and had got way out in the thin little branch and couldn't get back. You never saw an owl look so unhappy. He kept teetering up and down on the end of the branch and hoo, hoo, hooing at me to come and get him out of his fix. Dad and mother came out to see what was going on and they started to laugh because who ever heard of a bird that couldn't get itself out of a tree? But when people laughed at Wool, it hurt his feelings and upset him. What with the laughter and the fact that it was supper time and he was hungry, Wool got careless. Finally, he teetered a little too far and lost his balance. Hoo, 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 he streaked as he bounced through the branches towards the ground. Then all of a sudden, he spread his wings, and the next thing any of us knew, he was flying. Well, sort of flying. Not having done it before, he didn't really know what he was doing even then. You could tell he was just as surprised as we were. 
He came whooshing out of that tree like a rocket. He seemed to be heading straight for me, but I ducked and he pulled up and went shooting back up in the air again. He was still hoo hooing like mad when he stalled and slid back downward tail first and hit the ground with an awful thump. By that time, I was laughing so hard I had to lie on the grass and hold my stomach. When I looked up at last, it was to see Wool stomping into his cage. He was furious with all of us, and I couldn't persuade him to come out again until the next day. At supper that night, Father said, You know, I don't believe that owl realizes he's an owl. I believe he thinks he's a human being. You'll have to educate him, Billy. It wasn't quite as bad as that. Wool eventually did learn to fly pretty well, but he never seemed to like flying or to trust it. He still preferred to walk wherever he was going. Weeps never learned to fly at all. I tried to teach him how by throwing him off the garage roof, but he wouldn't try. He would just hit, just shut his eyes, give a hopeless kind of moan, and fall like a rock without even opening his wings. Weeps didn't believe he could fly, and that was that. Just before school ended, Wool learned a new trick, which bothered me a lot. He discovered that if he took a good swipe with his claws, he could tear a hole in the chicken wire of the cage. Once he learned to do this, it was impossible to keep him pinned up when he didn't want to be. This worried me because there was a lot of tough alley cats and tough dogs too in Saskatoon. I was afraid if one of them ever got hold of weeps or wool when I wasn't around, then that would be the end. After a look at the owl's claws and beaks, Mother said she thought it would be the end of any cat or dog that tackled wool or weeps, but I was still worried. One night, Wool had a little argument with Mutt about a bone, and Wool got mad and wouldn't come down under the tree to go in his cage at dusk. I called him and called him, but he just ignored me, and finally I had to go off to bed and leave him out. I slept pretty lightly that night with one ear cocked for trouble, because I knew the cats would be about. Sure enough, just at dawn, I heard a squawk and a scuffling noise outside. I hopped out of bed and grabbed my air gun and whipped out of the house as fast as I could. Wool wasn't in the tree. In fact, there was no sign of him anywhere in the front yard. I raced around the corner to the back, expecting to find him dead and eaten. But instead, I found him asleep on the back porch steps. He had his furs, r feathers ruffled out the back, the way birds do when they are asleep. And it wasn't until I got right up to him that I saw the cat. Wool was sitting on it, and only its head and tail stuck out beneath his feathers. But enough was showing so that I could see that the cat wasn't going to bother anyone anymore. I pulled Wool off, and he grumbled a bit. I think he'd found the cat made good foot warmers. It was a big ginger tomcat that lived two doors down the street and belonged to a big man who didn't like kids. This cat had been the terror of the birds and other cats and even the dogs in our neighborhood for years. I got a shovel and buried it at the bottom of the new garden. I suppose the cat thought wool was some kind of new chicken. Well, he found out differently. Dogs were no problem to my owls either. Though Mutt was no owl lover himself, he wouldn't let any strange dogs chase them. Not without a fight. 
Several times he saved weeps from a mauling, but he didn't need to look after wool. There was a German shepherd who lived near us, and one day this dog met wool out walking and decided to see how horned owl tasted. I heard the ruckus and came running. But by the time I got to the street, wool was sitting on the dog's back, digging his claws in for all he was worth and ripping chunks out of the dog's ears with his beak. The shep shepherd headed down Spadina Avenue, yip-yapping, yip-yapping, till you could have heard it in Timbuktu. Wool rode him for three blocks, and might have ridden him right out of town if the dog hadn't dodged through a hole in the board fence and knocked Wool off. I had chased after them on my bike, but by the time I got to the fence, Wool had picked himself up, given himself a shake or two to settle his feathers, and was his usual friendly self. He gave me a cheerful hoo, 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 and jumped up on the handlebars for a ride home. Words seemed to get around after that, and the neighborhood dogs took to crossing over to the other side of the road when they saw Wool coming. That's the end of chapter five of Owls and the Family. One more thing you might have heard there at the end of chapter 5 is that it said that you could have heard the yip yipping of that dog that Wool was on in Timbuk 2. Well, I wanted to show you the meaning of that saying real quick. Heard it in Timbuk 2. Heard it in Timbuk 2 means that something was so loud it could be heard in a very, very far away place. Because Timbuktu is in Africa. So here is our map showing Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and Canada in North America here. And there's Timbuktu way over here in Mali, Africa. There's Timbuktu. And so he was saying that dog was barking so loud, yip, yip, yapping about wool, hurting him so bad that you could. He was over here in Canada, and you could have heard it all the way over here in Timbuktu, Africa. So there are actually multiple different spellings of the name of the city Timbuktu. Of course, nothing can really be heard from Canada to Africa, but it is a saying that I heard it all the way in Timbuktu. I hope that you enjoyed reading Chapter 5 of Owls in the Family, and I hope that you'll come back to hear the next chapters by Farley Moat in our next video.